Okay guys, welcome to our first video of Unit 3, which is going to cover the years of 1754 to 1800. This unit really covers the revolution, the lead up to the revolution, and the years of the early republic. So let's get into it. So here are our uh, AP topics for Unit 3. Um, you can see there's 12 of them. And today we're going to be focusing actually on the first two. Very briefly, we're going to be looking at 3.1, which is contextualizing Unit 3. And then we're also going to spend some more time on 3.2, which discusses the French and Indian War. OK, so the context for Unit 3, you already know from the last lecture video, we already talked about this. By the mid 18th century, what's going on in the colonies? Well, in the British colonies, Enlightenment ideas have really begun to filter through and shift colonial thinking about government to start including concepts of natural rights and the social contract. And feel free to go back to that lecture video if you've kind of forgotten what these things are. Um, on top of that, the Great Awakening was the first fundamentally American cultural movement, which has happened in the 1730s, 40s, and 50s. And it is a religious movement, but it emphasized not just religion, but also concepts of individualism and greater social equality, and also a disdain for wealth and corruption. Increasingly, we're starting to see colonists looking at many of the colonial rulers, uh, at least those from the uh, British royal rulers as somewhat corrupt. Um, on the other side of the Atlantic, the British rulers are beginning to see salutary neglect as this antiquated notion, this idea that we should just, you know, leave the colonies alone and they're too expensive to worry about. Um, their mercantilist system in Britain was really kind of pushing to say, look, these colonies are meant to serve the mother country. That is the whole point of colonies is to help increase a favorable balance of trade so that we're exporting more products than we're importing. And Britain did see this as a system that benefited bro both. I mean, if the mother country is benefited, then certainly the colonies would benefit too. But the colonies are really beginning to question their role in that system. How much are they really benefiting from this? But it is really important to know, as we talk about the beginning of Unit 3 and the lead up to revolution, that right up until the actual eve of the American Revolution, and honestly, even after, many colonists, perhaps most of the British colonists, still saw themselves as British subjects, and many of them didn't want to break away. They just wanted a better deal from Britain. And in fact, I think your book even mentions that as late as 1776, and this is after the first bloodshed at Lexington and Concord, and up until 1776, the officers under General Washington were still toasting, God save the king. So really, it's not up until very much the eve of revolution that we start to see this fundamental shift in thinking. So the first couple of things we talk about are really just going to be about discontent growing in the colonies. OK, so let's swing into that. We're actually going to start by talking about 3.2, which talks about the French and Indian War. So what caused the French and Indian War? Now, the French and Indian War was actually part of a much larger conflict known as the Seven Years' War. And that Seven Years' War was fought by the French and the British and their allies uh, across three different continents. In some ways, it was the first truly global war. This is going to be fought in North America, Asia, particularly in India, and in Europe as well. Okay, so... What we're seeing because of how closely, if you can look at the pre-war boundaries in 1754 here, you can see how close um, the British North American colonies are right up against um, uh, the Canadian colonies. OK, you can see they're packed right up against them, especially in this kind of New England area. Um, there's very little kind of um, disputed uh, territory up there. So there's pretty regular skirmishes along the borders of New England and New France. Um, British settlers especially were beginning to encroach on French territories. More and more people moved to the British colonies. They were starting to move across into the Ohio River Valley, which is right kind of here. Um, if you sort of look in that, that sort of central area just past the British American colonies. Um, so this conflict, so the conflict itself was actually precipitated by none other than George Washington himself, um, who, uh, with uh, British troops and Native American allies, uh, kill a French diplomat. So that actually precipitates the war. Now, the first few years of the French and Indian War are mostly marked by French victories, uh, but that's because the British didn't have as many troops to kind of throw at it. Um, towards the last few years of the war, as fighting wrapped up in Silesia, which is in Europe, you're going to start to see the British sending more troops troops to North America, and ultimately this is going to be kind of the deciding factor. Uh, when the war finally ends in 1763 and the dust settles, the British are victorious. Um, 
in pretty much all of the continents, but certainly in North America. Um, the peace treaties in 1763 gave Britain possession, as you can see in the second image, of most of Canada and North America, including the Ohio River Valley. And you'll notice actually for a little while, France had virtually nothing. This green area here, that's actually Spanish territory right after the war. Uh, the French had to give up sea in Louisiana to Spain in 1763 for their support in the war. Uh, they are going to get it back later. Um, and then, of course, as we'll see later, they'll finally sell it back to the Americans uh, later on. But we'll talk about that in another unit. So. So, okay, so the reason why we're talking about the French and Indian War is there were pretty serious short and long term long term consequences of the French and Indian War. So um, something that some things that changed for the colonists now, it's important to note that the colonists were really encouraged to help aid the fighting be with the French in the colonies, because based on the idea that ultimately all the gains would be reaped by them. Uh, that territorial gains would only mean that there's more places for the British colonists to move into. So also the British colonists, right, had had, like we said, lots of skirmishes with the French Catholics. They were no serious friend to the Catholics. I mean, remember, the British are mostly Protestants and they see the Catholics as as pretty heretical. So they were pretty happy when the French lost and they were no longer uh, threatened by the French Catholics. And it's also important to note that this Seven Years' War, uh, the French and Indian War, is really going to push the American colonists closer together than ever before. It's a united effort. Now, if you look at this image here, this actually came from, comes from right before the Seven Years' War. In 1754, this was a uh, woodcut made by Benjamin Franklin. It says, join or die. Now, a lot of people think this refers to the American Revolution, but it doesn't. It was actually the Albany plan of union. The idea was to bring the colonies to closer together under central government. Now, this wasn't a push for independence whatsoever. Uh, this idea of having them under closer central government would actually probably have increased royal authority over them. Um, most people didn't want to do this. Most colonial rulers correctly saw this as something that might have um, in, impinged their own authority. So, so a lot of them just chose not to join it. But the point was that these kind of efforts or ideas of united colonies are starting to emerge during this time. Okay, so political consequences of the French and Indian War. So here's the deal. The British were not as good at diplomacy with the Native Americans as the French. And you can probably already get this from what we have talked about with the British colonists versus the French colonists in the last unit. The French had, as we know, a very largely peaceful relationship with Native allies based on trade. But the British mostly desired to impose order and gain profit from their new territory. It was more about how much profit can we get from this? So, for example, the French had engaged in, a, in the Indian practice of gift giving, of the exchanging of gifts. And the British had no desire to do this. So they ended this kind of friendly diplomatic exchange. They discouraged that they discouraged and regulated the sale of firearms and ammunition and gunpowder, which previously might have been gift giving or certainly at least traded with Native Americans. And a lot of Native Americans saw this as hostile and as a preparation to make war upon them. Okay, so ultimately, what's going to happen right after the French and Indian War uh, ends, we're going to see the development of another conflict, this time between the British and the Indians. Okay, and this is Pontiac's war. So Pontiac was a very um, ambitious Ottawa leader um, who recognized the need for a sort of pan-Indian attempt uh, as the only possibility to throw off European control. So um, to throw off European rule. So essentially uh, what Pontiac and his men did is they attacked and harassed British forts Along, around the Great Lakes area, the Appalachians, the Mississippi River. Um, they killed a couple of thousand soldiers and, um, and they were at first pretty successful, but ultimately the British response is absolutely brutal. They throw a lot of troops at this and they even wage a sort of primitive biological warfare in one instance sending uh, blankets infected with smallpox to the Native Americans. So disease and supply shortage really undermine the war effort. And that is ultimately going to end the, the war. Pontiac will settle for peace in 1766 and it's not really going to regain seven in 1769 Pontiac is going to be um, assassinated by another leader and um, and will never be able to kind of unite those groups again okay so the consequences of Pontiac's war though were enormous for the colonists and obviously for Native Americans as well but it really fundamentally changed the British Indian policy they realized how expensive it was going to be to manage these new colonies uh, they realized they would need a 
essentially a permanent British troop uh, presence if they wanted to protect their colonies from hostile Native American groups. Um, and if they wanted to prevent skirmishes from happening between colonists who are trying to encroach on Native American land, which which we know we see from the British colonists fairly frequently. So peace in the West was going to require royal protection of Indian lands, and they were going to need to regulate Anglo-American trade and trade activity with American Indians. So this is ultimately going to lead them to the Royal Proclamation of 1763. Basically, the British decide it is not worth the amount of money they'd have to spend to try to protect um, these, Amer these Indian lands. So they basically draw this red line that you can see here in this map. This is the proclamation line of 1763. And it basically says the Appalachians on the line between Indian territory and British colonies. British colonists, you can't move west of this line, which is a problem because as you recall, the whole point of the French and Indian War, the way they convinced colonists to fight was that, hey, guess what? You'll get all this new territory. In fact, some people had already precipitated this and hopped on over and were already living in the Ohio River Valley. Some have been living there for years and all of a sudden they're saying, nope, no, nope, no, nope, you can't do that. OK, so this um, prohibition of settlement into what becomes Indian territory marked like very widespread discontent for the colonists. They saw that territory as their just reward for seven years of warfare, which they fought in. So this is going to definitely contribute to the discontent that is really brewing in the years leading up to the American Revolution. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about other reasons for that discontent in the next video.